Hello, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. My name is Lance Marshall. I'm one of the associate pastors here at the First United Methodist Church of Fort Worth. This is The Gathering. It's a new worship service for new people. We're so thankful that you found yourself here today, particularly if you're a first timer. If you haven't already, please make sure to get coffee and breakfast foods off the back. We do drink coffee and eat food during the entire service because it's what I like to do. Uh, we also have Bibles on the back. If you didn't bring your own Bible, I encourage everyone to bring their own Bible every week for taking notes and following along. If you don't have yours, please make sure to grab one off the rack in the back. Uh, we start right off with a couple of announcements. Uh, Dave is one of our leaders and has a special announcement as we start. All right, so just real quick, um, the, I've been leading a Bible study. Uh, it's been on break for about a month. Uh, if you guys were in my Bible study, that's awesome. If you're interested in joining it, now's the time. Uh, it starts back up next Sunday, but because I'm so super duper organized and I've been gone the last two weeks, I just realized that the reading for it starts tomorrow. Um, if you are interested in taking the class, you do not have to have money today, but I have books that are going to be in the back of the room uh, back there to the side. Uh, come talk with me after the service, and I will get you a book, and you can pay me for it later. Uh, it's a really fantastic Bible study. We go through a whole bunch of different stuff, and there's about 30 minutes of reading a day. So if you're interested in joining, let me know. And the Bible? I'm sorry? Uh, it's, sorry, it's the Covenant Bible Study. Uh, the book that I have is Living the Covenant. This is going to be the second of three eight-week sessions. It's a really highly endorsed Bible study. I've taught it a couple of times. Highly recommend it. Dave's Bible study discussion meets at 11 o'clock on Sundays, correct? So, correct? I'm talking. Correct. correct. So, uh, starting next week, uh, you would come to the gathering at 930 and go to the Bible study at 11. It's great. Can't recommend it enough. Uh, talk to Dave in the back. He can get you caught up. Okay, a couple announcements. I don't know if you guys know, but the weather has been nuts recently. Uh, one of the things we talked about last week was how our church responds to not only this, but all natural disasters. Uh, we have a couple pictures to show you. Earlier this week, our church sent an ERT, an emergency response team, uh, down... Um, hello. We have pictures to show you. Uh, yeah, there we go. Uh, our, we have a group of emergency response trained folks. These are folks who know how to use the chainsaw, how to, how to go into dangerous areas. Uh, Corpus Christi was ready for us, uh, so we sent a group of trained volunteers down earlier last week. They spent the week helping out in some flooded out homes, doing things like this, uh, ripping up floorboards, just helping people sort through all that kind of stuff. Next picture, we're also taking care of a bunch of uh, just the debris that accumulates. That's a collapsed ceiling that people needed help cleaning out of a home. Uh, next one, we also helped people tarp up their roofs. Uh, a lot of them obviously had hurricane damage to the roofs of their house, so our team took down a whole bunch of tarps, uh, helped work the local community. Um, next photo. Uh, that's, that's it, right? So if you, the last slide, um, we are still obviously collecting and supporting uh, the ongoing relief for this hurricane and other, and other natural disasters to follow. We do all of this through an organization called UMCOR. That's the United Methodist Committee on Relief. If you're one of those people that uh, has a bunch of things on their Facebook feed that are sharing the way that a lot of other disaster response organizations frustrate some and how they allocate resources or whatever, I just want to lift up UMCOR to you. It's an organization that 100% of its operating costs are covered by the church, so 100% of your gifts go directly into the community to receive in aid. Uh, so we do all of our disaster work through UMCOR. Uh, we also have opportunities for you to become um, emergency response trained in the future. The next one is January 18th here at the church. So if you're one of those people that wants to go in and actually physically help out, in the future we'll help you be trained and ready to do that. So uh, next announcement. I uh, want to let you know that our church partners uh, with an organization called Kids Hope. Kids Hope is an organization that sets up volunteers into one-on-one -on -one, uh, mentoring relationships with elementary school kids. Uh, the research is ironclad. If a person who's a high-risk student uh, has a one-on-one -on -one mentor that they meet with on a weekly basis, uh, they are more likely to stay in school, they are more likely uh, to get their homework done, they are more likely to achieve, um, they are more likely to succeed. And so our, our church uh, signs up people to serve in those relationships at T.A. Sims Elementary, uh, which is a high-needs elementary school here in Fort Worth. Uh, I'm just giving you kind of a pre-announcement because next Sunday, the 17th, in the garden, Kids Hope is going to be outside. They're going to have a bunch of information. They're going to be able to sign you up to volunteer. They're going to be able to walk you through the process. If you're interested in it but intimidated by it, they're the folks who you can talk to. Uh, who can help you figure out if this is the right opportunity for you. So that's going to be in the garden uh, before the gathering and after the gathering next Sunday, right out here through these windows at the tables. So uh, if you or someone you know is interested, stop by, talk to them. It's really fantastic. Okay, last announcement. Uh, I don't know if you guys know this, but we have a lot of people at the gathering now, uh, which is awesome. That also means that there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, we have a wonderful and stellar group of volunteers, but sometimes people are away. 
Uh, sometimes people uh, aren't available on a week-to-week basis. And also, a number of you who have just joined are loving it here and want a way to meet more people, right? To get connected. And if you want to become one of the people who, when they show up to a church on Sunday, knows people and is known and gives the hugs and the how you doings and then talks noise about how their football team lost again, it's great because there's so many Aggies who volunteer, so you can just keep going at it. I love it. Says the Texas guy, right? And so uh, if you're one of the people who wants that kind of relationship, volunteering is the best way to do it. Uh, we also have a specific need for uh, some audiovisual volunteers. Same person's been rowing the boat really hard for the gathering in its entire existence. So if you're one of the people who, who would feel comfortable with a computer kind of advancing slides, if you can do PowerPoint, you can help the gathering. If you're one of the people that's comfortable doing that uh, or volunteering in any way, on the back of your attendance card, it says a little checkbox that says, I'm interested in, in volunteering at the gathering and has the 9.30 and 11 o'clock slots. If you would check that, if you're comfortable with AV, if you would just write AV, your computer next to that too, that would let us know that you're one of the people that's comfortable with that kind of stuff. We'd love to have you. It's fun. It's really easy. It's very well organized because I'm not involved in organizing it. Um, so on that note, the attendance card when you sat down on the front has room for you to write your name and your email address. Whether this is your first time or your 100th time at the gathering, I ask that you make note that you joined us today. Uh, I'm so thankful that you're here. Um, also, we uh, pass the baskets, and two things go in our baskets. One is those attendance cards. The other thing is our financial gifts and our offerings, our support for what God is doing in the world through this portion of the body of Christ, our church. If you're one of the people like my family that gives online, there's a little token, a little card in your seat that says, I give online. Uh, you can place that in the basket as it comes around. That helps our kids see the way in which we're faithful in our support of the church and also our congregation uh, see the way in which we're, we're faithful and supportive because you are absolutely both of those things. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and pass those baskets around. The way that we start uh, every time of worship together is through an invocation led by one of our own. Samantha's going to lead us. Standard church rule apply. She's going to do the leader's part. We are going to all say together the bold in italics. Now, let us prepare our hearts and minds for worship. Samantha leads us. Come out of the darkness of despair into the brightness of God's transforming love. We praise God for God's presence with us. Prepare your hearts and spirits to receive God's mercy and healing. We thank God for God's mercy toward us. Come, let us praise and worship God who is always with us. Thanks be to God at all times and in all places. Amen. Good morning. You guys ready to sing? We're doing it different today. We have live music. Are you guys excited? We have some live music, and I just want you all to sing with me, okay? I think this is a very familiar hymn. Here we go. What a friend we have in Jesus. All our sins and griefs what a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. carry everything to God in prayer. Next verse. Have we trials and temptations? Is there trouble anywhere? We should never be discouraged. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can we find a friend so faithful who will all our sorrow share? Jesus knows our every weakness. 
Take it to the Lord in prayer. Can I get one more verse out of you? Are we weak and heavy laden? Come, but with the Lord of care. Precious Savior, still our refuge. Take it to the Lord in Do thy friends despise, forsake thee? Take it to the Lord in prayer. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou will find a solace there. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Last time, everything to God in prayer. Everything to God in prayer. Y'all sound amazing. Amen. Everyone, that is, uh, I would like to introduce Kevin, by the way. Kevin, thank you so much for being with us together this morning. One of the things we do every time we gather together as a church is to pray together, to speak to God together, knowing that God listens, to listen to God together, knowing that God speaks to us. Uh, we do this through something we call prayers of the people. Let me tell you how it's going to work. I lead it with, an, with a prayer of confession. Uh, first off, prayers of confession aren't about beating ourselves up or about being negative. They're just about being honest, honest about where God is meeting each and every one of us today for all the good and for all the bad, uh, where God is actually with us today. Um, at the end, we'll do a call and response. I'll say, Lord, in your mercy, and you'll all say, hear our prayer. Let's try that. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Then do a Trinitarian prayer. Uh, use language of Father, Son, Holy Spirit, maybe Creator, Redeemer, Sustainer. Uh, this language of the Trinitarian nature of God and God's interaction with each and every one of us with that same call and response at the end. Then I'll say a few names, and after that, I'll say, are there any others? And it's a chance for you to say names. Chance for you to say names of people who have joys that we want to celebrate, maybe yours, maybe someone you know, uh, that we want to bring to God in praise and thanksgiving. It's a chance to say the names of some people that we know are suffering, who are experiencing loss, fear, death, despair, depression, hopelessness, violence, who knows. It's a chance for us to bring those names to the altar. In a group this size, uh, obviously we don't try to speak one at a time, that's just not possible. So the names kind of run and fill the room all around us. It's beautiful because that's how always and everywhere God hears the prayers of the faithful. Uh, rising up to heaven. So with that being said, let us now prepare our hearts and minds and go to God in prayer. Forgiving and loving God, our hearts are filled today with pain and concern for the future of humankind. Words of anger assail our airways. We cannot escape from the threats being thrown about. In our fear, we cry, where are you, O Lord? We wander around in the darkness of the spirit, seeking light and hope. Forgive us when we forget that you are always with us through times of peace and times of pain. Heal our souls. Help us to reach out to others with the assurance of your love and presence. For we ask all of this in Jesus' name. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, you made everything and called it good. And evidence of that goodness continues to break forth all around us, new hope, new lives, new families, new jobs, new opportunities, new loves. For all of this, O oh God, we give you thanks and sing your praise. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. At the same time, O oh God, we live in a world that experiences death, destruction, violence, pain, disease, depression, despair. Remind us, O oh God, that in the midst of everything, you did not give up on us, did not walk away from us, did not forsake us. Instead, you joined us entered into the fullness of time through the blood of your Son, Jesus the Christ, not to forsake us, but to redeem us, remake us, re reconcile us to you once and forever. For this, O God, we sing your praise and give you thanks. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. God, as the waters rise, God, as the winds blow, God, as the storms envelop, remind us that we are never alone. 
Through your Holy Spirit, O oh God, you know us. Guide us and keep us now and every day of our lives. For this, O oh God, we give you thanks and sing your praise. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. For Andy, Lord, in your mercy. For Laura, Lord, in your mercy. For Holly, Lord, in your mercy. Are there any others? Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Hear these prayers, O Lord, the prayers of your people, the prayers of your faithful, the prayers of your church. Always and everywhere, O God, fill our hearts with your grace, pierce the darkness with your light, and Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. Amen. All right, everyone, welcome. If this is your first time to the gathering, a special welcome to you. My name is Lance Marshall. Uh, this place was created to make a new place that was casual and hopefully engaging and welcoming to new folks where you could come in on the ground floor and be a part of something new. If this is your first time here, the whole thing just started a year ago, so everyone else here is new too. I hope that you make a friend, make a connection while you're here today. Uh, one of the ways that we talk in the gathering is through something called series. It's taking a block of conversations a month or more at a time and focusing on important topics. A couple months ago, we did a, an entire series called Thank God for Science, focusing on the relationship uh, between science and faith and how those things can be mutually strengthening, strengthening mutually compatible. Uh, we, sometimes we talk on books of the Bible for an extended period of time. Sometimes we just focus on important conversations that need to happen. And so uh, one of the things that I've shared a number of weeks in a row is that I feel like this is the, the new year, right? I feel like this is, I feel like the time you go back to school, the time the weather changes, the time the football comes back, I feel like that's the new year, right? More, much more so than January 1st. And so to help start out our new year, I wanted to have kind of a new year uh, series of topics on some incredibly important issues, some universal issues, uh, some issues that are vital to all people everywhere, no matter how old you are, no matter where you grew up, uh, no matter what culture you're from, these are the vital issues of life. Uh, they're issues of sex, death, and money. And so I'm really creative, so this is what I called it. Um, this is what I wanted to call this series of talks. I wanted to talk about things like sex, death, and money, and hopefully in a way that are PG and family appropriate, but at the same time are honest and real and openly engage with what we're really talking about when we're talking about sex, death, and money. And specifically, I wanted to bring up the idea that one of the reasons that these things, amongst all the topics we can talk about in life and with our family and our friends, all the things we can talk about in church, one of the reasons that these things are so vitally sensitive, right, they're so important, is because what we're really when we're talking about them, we're talking about the thing behind the thing, right? And specifically, we talked about sex the first couple of weeks, the idea that when you're talking about sex, particularly in your own life or in the lives of people you care about or your children, God forbid, uh, you know, what you're really talking about is the thing behind the thing, right? When there's a lot of different parts of our biology that don't have the same emotional weight and sensitivity, spiritual influence that sex does, it's because when you're talking about sex, what you're really talking about is things like knowing and being known. You're talking about things like intimacy, like vulnerability, like openness to other people, and what happens when that time tends to go bad in life. You know, how does all this interact and work together? Uh, we talked about the way that you think about sex, your own sex and other people's. It says a lot about what you think about yourself. It says a lot about what you think about other people. It says a lot about what you think about God, right? So when we talked about those kind of things, we realized that when we're talking about sex, what we're talking about is the thing behind the thing. We're talking about all of that stuff, right? If you ever want to catch up on a message of any kind, you can always find them uh, on the YouTube page at the church. You can watch my goofy physical presence, uh, or you can catch up on the podcast and only have to, and someone told me they really enjoy the podcast because they can slow it down. So good for you. I didn't know that was a possibility. <laughs> They, <laughs> you can slow it down to a normal speaking pace. Uh, <laughs> someone came, oh, a really sweet visitor came up to me. And she was like, God bless. I love the service. It was so fantastic. Didn't understand a word you said. <laughs> I said, sorry. It's my, I've been working on this for 30 plus years. This is how far I've gotten. Uh, so we talked about the thing, the idea of the thing behind the thing. We talked about death. 
the last couple of weeks, right? And when we talk about death, we're talking about more than just dying, right? What we're really talking about is the thing behind the thing. Uh, I was gone two weeks ago leading a retreat, so my good friend, handsome Johnny, came in and spoke, and uh, Johnny was talking about the understanding that when you're talking about death, what you're really talking about is life, of course, right? We know that. And when you're, t- when you're talking about having a good death or being ready for death or being prepared for death, you're talking about the most important thing in the world, and that is, what, what is, what is it to be alive, right? To actually experience life. We're talking about the thing behind the thing. Uh, last week, we also talked about the understanding that one of the things that makes death so hard is it's one of the one things that every one of us knows we are all going to go through, right? Uh, we know we're all going to experience, and yet no one ever really talks about what it feels like to go through it, you know? <laughs> it's the one thing uh, we, we actually know we're going to experience but don't have a lot of prep work for, and so that's scary, that's intimidating, that's unsettling. And so we talked about that last week, and hopefully uh, it's a framework to help make that process a little bit easier. And so sex, death, money. Uh, so money in church is interesting, right? Particularly the way that money gets talked about in church. It's very polarized. It tends to go in uh, you know, a couple different directions. In a lot of churches, money seems to get brought up all the time, <laughs> right? Like all the time. It seems like every sermon doesn't go to the cross. It goes to the wallet, <laughs> right? <laughs> and of course, all of that language is always in the context of faithfulness and trusting God and prioritizing God's work in the world and faithful stewardness, uh, uh, stewarding of resources and faithful support of the body of Christ, your church, all of those things any good church will support and agree on, but it happens in a way that really raises a lot of red flags, right? It's seeming like the church is just as materialistic as every other part in life sometimes. It just feels like that. Let's be honest. Some churches really feel like that. Some congregations, particularly when you're getting new, really kind of feel that way. And so in response to that, of feeling like it's being overdone, a lot of congregations will then just never talk about money. Never bring it. It's gauche. It's, it's rude. People will just kind of pick up on it. Uh, it just completely gets avoided in every context, right? And that may sound really good, but that tends to result in is two things. It tends to result in really weak churches uh, that aren't equipped to do the work that God's calling them to in the world. And more importantly, it tends to result in a lot of really weak disciples, people whose understanding of faith and faithfulness kind of stops at the doors of what happens on a Sunday morning, right? They really struggle to, to interact with the idea that who you are as a follower of Jesus Christ, who you are as a disciple, encompasses all aspects of your life, right? So in the gathering, this is, if you're new, welcome. Uh, one of the things I do want you to know is that we talk about money a lot in here. We just do, it's true. Uh, it's on purpose. We talk about money a lot in here uh, because Jesus talks about money all the time. Jesus talks about money. Do you realize that? Uh, The majority of the parables have a financial element to them. Jesus talks about money all the time. And he talks about money all the time, not because he's trying to build a building, right? Not because he's trying to fund a ministry. Has none of those things, right? Not because he's trying to collect a salary. Has none of those things. Jesus is talking about money all the time because the truth of the matter is your relationship with money is deeply connected to your relationship with God, your relationship to others, your relationship to others who are intimate in your life, your relationship to your understanding of who you are in the world, right? It's just true. Jesus talks about money all the time. So we talk about money all the time in the gathering. One of the ways that I think helps that uh, be a little bit more fruitful to you, are do, I do something called setting ground rules when I talk about money. I do two things. One, I let you know that uh, 80% of the time when I'm talking about money, it's about this personal spiritual relationship, right? It's your spiritual interaction with money. Right, I'm trying to talk about money in the way that Jesus talked about money. And I am telling you in advance that when it's time for us to talk about money in the context of stewardship and, and supporting the church and so the church's ministry in the world and being who God called us to be, I'll let you know up front that's what we're talking about. Right? So you don't feel like I okey-doked you. Um, I'll let you know when it's time to have that conversation because 80% of the time we're having the other one. And I'll let you know when we're having the one about the budget and the pledge and, and figuring out how we're going to be in ministry to Fort Worth, Texas. Right? By the way, Mid-October through mid-November. Um, <laughs> stewardship time, y'all. Uh, and the second way that I hopefully make this conversation a little bit more fruitful is by setting the second ground rule. And the second ground rule of the conversation that you need to know is that there are no pastoral exemptions. 
to this conversation, right? When I'm specifically talking about money, I am included in every single one of those conversations. Uh, that's often, you know, in, in retrospect, I have a habit of when we're specifically doing those fundraising conversations, I make it very clear that my family tithes. I even will say exactly how much money my family gives to the church every single month, because you need to know I'm in the same boat too, right? There is no preacher's exemption to financial stewardship. And the second way uh, that I need you to know that I'm in the same boat too, that this also applies to me, is that's not just in things like being faithful uh, and being a steward, but it also has to relate to your own spiritual health and welfare and how you think about money. Let me give you an example. So uh, those of you who were here last week know that in the middle of last, the week before, I went to uh, New Mexico for a personal spiritual retreat, and I drove there, which was interesting because I grew up in Tarrant County, uh, but all my family's in East Texas, more of a city guy, not super outdoorsy, huge surprise. And so uh, more of a city kid. I've been west of 820 like four times in my life. <laughs> and, uh, and then specifically, I've been past Weatherford once, and it was for this trip, right? <laughs> I was like, I felt like uh, an explorer. I'm like Ponce de Leon. I'm like, look at all this. <laughs> no one's ever seen this before, right? I'm like naming towns. <laughs> like... <laughs> Uh, no one's, I've never been out here before at all, and that wore off in about 15 minutes. Um, I don't know if y'all have driven through West Texas before, but it leaves a lot of time for daydreaming. Uh, at one point, I just like tied a stick to the wheel and took a nap, and so I'm out there, and I'm driving, and uh, I'm, I'm just thinking and not really any focused, and I'm going, I'm, I want to get clear, I'm going on a spiritual retreat, right? Pastor, personal spiritual retreat. It's me and JC for a week, right? That's it. No cell phone coverage, no nothing. Got my books to read, got my prayers, my prayers to pray, going out there to be with my Lord. And I'm driving, and I'm thinking. And uh, for those of you who don't know, my personal attitude toward vehicles, my dream vehicle is a sofa with four wheels. I just love comfort in cars. And like whenever I see an 85-year-old guy driving a Lincoln Town car, I look, I'm like, he's doing life right, <laughs> right? <laughs> he's got this thing figured out. And so I'm driving, and uh, I'm thinking, and I'm like hitting bumps and stuff and uh, kind of bouncing around. And I'm like, you know what I really, I want a new car. <laughs> right? I'm thinking, like, Man, I really want a new car. Um, and then specifically, uh, I got, my wife and I got an Uber a couple weeks ago. And uh, I accidentally hit Uber XL or like Lyft. Like black, I got the nice one. I, knew, I normally get like the car with three wheels and like a bumper, <laughs> you know, like a bungee holding the trunk together. That's what I normally get. But I got a nice one, and we got to ride home in the back of a Denali, like leather seats. And, that was, and I was like, oh, like how, the, how the other half lives, right? And, uh, and I grew up, my parents drove Suburbans for 30 years. And so I grew up riding a Suburban. And in Northeast Tarrant County in the 90s, the Suburban was like the state bird of Texas. Like everyone, everyone only had Suburbans. So I grew up riding in Suburbans. And I'm driving, I was like, you know what, I just, I want a Suburban. <laughs> Man, I just want a Suburban. I mean, look at me, Fort Worth, Texas, right? Not driving a Suburban, heresy, right? Of course I need a Suburban. And then, you know, I'm talking about, how, I think about how I want a Suburban. And, uh, and, uh, and I'm trying to think about, man, it'd be so much more comfortable. I mean, if my back wouldn't hurt as much, I'd be better at ministry, of course. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I've got a family now. You know, I got to I gotta really get a car that'll better work for my family, right? And I start, and of course, I'm using the language want, and before long, 15 minutes in, I start using what word to describe? Need. need. Yeah, I need a Suburban, right, to drive my family around, right? My family of three, <laughs> <laughs> all of whom are this tall, this tall, or this tall. I don't have the Harlem Globetrotters in my car, right? <laughs> I don't need this. And I'm like, well, then I could buy more, I could buy, like, uh, stuff to upgrade the house, right? Like housework is in my, like house repairs in my future. Long story short, I've just got into this language. I'm, I'm like literally, I am literally, this is me, right? Your, your pastor. I'm literally driving on a spiritual retreat to go spend time with Jesus. And I've gotten distracted. And what is now dominating my mind is that I need a suburban, <laughs> right? And then I kind of snap out of it. I go like, holy smokes, dude, what are you doing? Of course not. Like, I have, I, don't, I have an old car, I have an eight-year-old car, but it has 48,000 miles on it. Like, it is not like it's about to break down or anything. <laughs> Reference to everybody who was here last week. <laughs> right? But I do not, 
I do not need a suburban. At some point, it'll be time for a new car. One car will be dead. And at that point, you can save up and you can do it. We have way more pressing financial goals in our life, right? We need to, we have, we have focus. We have, we, this is something else. I, I do not need a suburban. Let me tell you right now. What I am doing is I am coveting and I am fantasizing over money and I'm thinking that it will change my life, right? In some way that I know for a fact it will not. I am in the same boat too. When we talk about money and when we talk about the traps that it sets for us, I am literally on the way to a spiritual retreat and for, I, for a good half hour I fell in that trap. So I just wanted to let you know I fall into all these traps too. I need these pieces of scripture just as much as anybody else. I need these lessons just as much as anybody else. So I want you to know uh, I'm, we're all marching on perfection. I've got just as much work to do as anybody else. So um, that being said, if anyone's selling a car, hit me. Uh, let me know. <laughs> so I want to talk to you a little bit about uh, a lesson in this. I have a piece of scripture I knew I wanted to read. It's in Luke 12. If you turn to Luke with us, um, it says we're going to go through 60 verses. We're not. We're going to do about half of that. Um, and there's a particular piece of scripture that we're going to talk about today that's extremely famous uh, in the context of it. And uh, before we get into that, we talked about the thing behind the thing, right? Um, I want to talk about two things behind the thing that might be at play when we talk about money. Right, when we're talking about money in our lives, particularly when we're talking about the interaction between money and our spiritual lives, um, we can be talking about two things. I did not grow up in a greedy family at all, right? I'm very thankful for that. I did grow up in a family where the language of money was always language about um, security and provision, right? It was always, it was always couched in that. It's always about good jobs and savings and so you can be prepared, right? So nothing wrong with that, by the way. When we're talking about money in our lives, um, one of the things, the thing behind the thing is we're talking about what it is to be taken care of, what it is to feel secure and safe, you know, what it is to feel like your life is built on something solid. When we're talking about money, one of the things that we're really talking about is that. And, um, and one of the other things that we can, we we're always talking about when we're talking about money is this dichotomy, particularly having it and what it gets used for. We're talking about this, um, this you can think of it as scale, or you think of it as a plurality. We're talking about ourself and about others. Specifically, what is life about, right? What is life for? Is it about taking your piece of the pie and living large and having what you want and indulging as much as life as possible? Or is it about using resources for changing the lives of others, right? And providing for others, equipping others, saving, literally saving other people. What is money for, right? Now, a very few people live on one end of the spectrum. A very few people live on the other end of the spectrum. I would wager that every single person in this room lives somewhere in the middle, right? It's both, right? It's both having for your family and it's both providing for others and equipping others. So how do we actually meet that out, right? How do we actually find the right spot? We're going to be talking about both of these things uh, over the next two weeks, this one this week, this one the next. Um, one of the main things I need you to understand, uh, particularly if you've gone to a lot of different church communities, one of the things I want to make it very clear is that money is not bad, right? It's really easy to demonize money, right? Um, there's a, First Timothy gets misquoted a lot by saying money is the root of all evil, right? That's not what the scripture actually says. What does it actually say? Anyone remember? The love. the love of money is the root of all evil, right? Money itself is not the root of anything. It's just money. Same time, money's not good either. Money is not inherently good. It's value neutral. What has a value is what it means to you, how you interact with it, how you use it, what place it takes in your life, right? That's what we're actually talking about. So money's not good, money's not bad. What, you ha what is important is your relationship with it, how it fits into your life. Back to Luke 12. So there's a, there's a specific pericope, that's a fancy church word that means little story. Um, there's a parable, actually. Jesus teaches through parables a lot. Um, parables are longer stories where you kind of look into the different characters and take a meaning out, not only for that time and place, but also for our time and place. Uh, this is a particular parable about a rich man. Um, he's a rich man, and then he has a bountiful crop, right? Gets even richer. Um, and in the context, his community would have understood that, that was an act of God that did that for him. He gets even richer. His response is to not, uh, is to is respond to that extra gift of God, that extra largesse, to store up even more for himself, right? To make himself even richer, right? Well beyond what he needs or what he could possibly consume, 100% focused on self and selfishness. That's what the parable is about, but what I need you to understand is the context in which that story comes out, right? That is what I think is ultimately more interesting for us today. 
So uh, before we get there, in Luke 11, previously, Jesus is talking to a group of Pharisees, right? These are religious leaders. These are the people who think they, all, they have it all figured out. They're one of Jesus' main adversaries over the course of the gospel stories. And uh, one of the major um, lessons that Jesus has interacting with other people, particularly in context of the Pharisees, he's warning those who would follow him. These Pharisees look like they have it all figured out on the outside, and on the inside, they are just as ugly and nasty and selfish as they were before they ever got involved in this God business, right? They look good on the outside, but what really matters is the inside, right? That's a bigger conversation he's having with them. Inside, outside. So he, he finishes absolutely just blowing up the spot of these Pharisees. And then he, uh, then he moves on, and then a crowd follows him. That's where we're going to pick up, Luke 12. When a crowd of thousands upon thousands had gathered so that they were crushing each other, I mean, there's so, there's so many people around him, they can barely even stand. Jesus began to speak first to his disciples. Watch out for the yeast of the Pharisees, he says to them. I mean the mismatch between their hearts and lives. Nothing is hidden and won't be revealed. Nothing is secret that won't be brought out into the open, meaning God's seeing what's going on with you. Therefore, whatever uh, you have said in the darkness will be heard in the light, and whatever you have whispered in the rooms deep inside the house will be announced from the rooftops. Your life's an open book to God. I tell you, my friends, don't be terrified by those who can kill the body, but after that, do nothing more. I'll show you whom you should fear. Fear the one who, after you have been killed, has the authority to throw you into hell. Indeed, I tell you, that's the one you should fear. Aren't five sparrows sold for two small coins? Yet not one of them is overlooked by God. Even the hairs on your head are all counted. Don't be afraid. You are worth more than many sparrows. So in the midst of all of this pressure from the outside world that's saying how to live, how to be, etc., focus on what God says is good. Focus on what God wants from you. Focus on what God has set out for you, not what all of these cultural messages are sending your way. He's speaking in a religious context. He could be speaking to any context, right? Focus on what's really important. The mismatch of heart and life that other people have going on will lead you to death and destruction. Focus on the way that leads you to God. Then he keeps teaching. I tell you, everyone who acknowledges me before humans, the human one, meaning the Son of Man, meaning himself, will acknowledge before God's angels. But the one who rejects me before others will be rejected before God's angels. Anyone who speaks a word against the human one will be forgiven, but whoever insults the Holy Spirit won't be forgiven. When they bring you before the synagogues, rulers, and authorities, don't worry about how to defend yourself or what you should say. The Holy Spirit will tell you at that very moment what you should say. The way to God, he's saying, is through me. The way to the right relationship with God is through Jesus. The one you should be following and listening to is Jesus. The one who you acknowledge here on earth is the one who will acknowledge you in heaven, right? The way is through me. Jesus is teaching to this crowd, right? So many people, thousands upon thousands, are hearing this message. It's not about focusing on these earthly teachers who would evaluate to be good enough or not good enough, fit in or not fit in. It's about your relationship with God. Your relationship with God is through me. He's just getting going into the sermon. We're all starting to feel it. There's nods around the room, and some yokel stands up. (laughs) Someone from the crowd said to him, meaning some dude interrupts him, Meaning, some guy stands up and says, yeah, 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 Jesus, what about this? Someone from the crowd said to him, teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. (laughs) It's literally the same argument is, I really enjoy this sermon, Lance. I'm having a business dispute, right? I'm really enjoying what's happening here. My wife and I are arguing about cash. I'm really enjoying what's happening here in the middle of this sermon. Tell me a little bit about my relationship with money, right? In the middle of this message, uh, this man interrupts with a financial quandary. Jesus' response, which is maybe my favorite thing he ever says, outside from all like the really good stuff. (laughs) Jesus said to him, man, who appointed me as judge or referee between you and your brother, right? That's something that preachers say to themselves all the time. (laughs) Man, who appointed me as judge? Click, (laughs) like right? Man, who appointed me the judge or referee between you and your brother, right? You're, what? I'm in the middle of this sermon. The way to, the the most important thing in life is your relationship with God. The way to God is through me, and you're standing up with an arguing contest about money. You're literally interrupting the message for a question about money. So he says this. Jesus says to them, watch out. 
Guard yourself against all kinds of greed. After all, one's life isn't determined by one's possessions, even when someone is very wealthy. Then he told them a parable. A certain rich man's land produced a bountiful crop. He said to himself, what will I do? I have no place to store my harvest. Then he thought, here's what I'll do. Look, just take a look here. If you're writing in your Bible or taking notes, circle personal pronouns. Uh, if you're watching on the screen, use your eyes. <laughs> what will I do? I have no place to store my harvest. Then he thought, here's what I'll do. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger ones. That's where I'll store all my grain and goods. I'll say to myself, you have stored up plenty of goods, enough for several years. Take it easy. Eat, drink, and enjoy yourself. But God said to him, fool, tonight you will die. Meaning, here's what I think about your plans. <laughs> now who will get the things you have prepared for yourself? This is the way it will be for those who hoard for themselves and aren't rich towards God. God speaks to us through the reading of Scripture. Thanks be to God. In the middle of all this, here's what Jesus thinks about your attitude towards money. Watch out for greed of every kind. When they're talking about it, right, what are they really talking about? The thing behind the thing, right? He goes on to talk more uh, for the sake of expediency. I don't want to go um, to the point of reading it all to you, but I can tell you it goes through this. The next topic that comes up is the topic about provision, right? If you talk about God providing for all the lilies in the field, the portion of that gets repeated here. Talks that God provides, right? Maybe not the way you want, maybe not what you're looking for, maybe not what you think are culturally appropriate, maybe not what you desire with your heart of hearts, but God does provide, he goes on to say. And then he says this, he goes on to give a warning about being prepared, and he specifically talks about the context of the end. That's what's called uh, eschatolo eschatological expectations, right? Jesus talks about this relationship with money and about God's provision in the context of the end, right? Eschaton sometimes gets referred to as the end of the world. What can also refer to is the completion of God's purposes, meaning the point at which God gets what God wants, meaning the point at which God's work is done, right? He's talking about your relationship with money and your reliance on God in the context of God's eschatological expectations, the work that Jesus has come to arrive, uh, announce, which is basically to say that God will get what God wants, right? God's work is ongoing, and God's work will end with God's coming, uh, with the coming of God's kingdom, right? And so we experience the eschaton, and the eschaton is not limited to just like Kirk Cameron left behind stuff, right? I mean, each and every single one of us faces an eschaton. Each and every single one of us faces the end. We all do. Talk about it two weeks in a row, right? Each and every one of us faces the end, and Jesus is talking about make sure your relationship with money is uh, taken with the understanding that you are all facing the end, and how prepared are you for the end? Because that's a part of it. And if it wasn't clear enough, one of the things he says out is that his way is controversial. That's how the rest of Luke 12 goes, right? That's a quick overview. It's a really good story about money, right? It's a really good story about not letting money own us. It's a really good story about not looking at getting more as an immediate excuse to have more, right? It's a really good uh, story about making sure that when we understand, sometimes bounties come our way so that we can go about the business of God's work in the world, going about being about God's kingdom, going about doing God's work, about uh, being rich toward the Lord, as Jesus himself says. Sometimes when it comes time, that's what it's all about, right? It's a very important story for that, but this story placed in the middle of this is also a really good reminder that sometimes you will be right in the middle of trying to find Jesus. Sometimes you will be right in the middle to trying to find God. Sometimes you will be right in the middle of trying to figure out what this thing is all about, and then all of a sudden, what you want to interrupt and say is, when do I get my suburban? Next time you have these thoughts, right, in your life, next time you have the thought about X will make me happy, right? The example I always use when I'm talking to younger people is that uh, in 1998, I became convinced that if I mowed enough lawns and saved up enough money and bought myself a mini-disc player, I would be happy forever. 
right? That's the Betamax of my generation, <laughs> right? Next time, you're in the, next time you get caught in that spiral, which we all get caught up in, right? That that house would make me happy, right? That that backsplash would make me happy, <laughs> right? I know what y'all watch. That's the real lusting that's going on in here. <laughs> Subway tile. <laughs> yeah, you know who you are. <laughs> Remember that for your entire life, for your best friend's entire life, you will be on the journey to try to find Jesus and all of those covetous thoughts, those questions, those burning desires to interrupt your Lord's message to you with questions about money will pop up over and over and over again. Jesus talks about provision. He says God provides. Do you believe it? Jesus talks about provision. He says God provides. Do you believe it? Next time you're in the middle of your long journey to find God and you find yourself distracting yourself with more thoughts and worries and concerns about money. Try one time pushing it away and jumping back into the rest of the message. Let us pray. Great and loving God, every day of our lives we will worry about money. Every day of our life we will try to put money where you belong as the thing that we can trust in as the thing that we can hope in, as the thing that would make our life worth living, as the thing that would give us the strength to go on another day. God, every single day, we will interrupt Jesus' message about grace and hope and peace and love with questions about what we have and how we can get more. Guide us, O oh God, to the rest of the sermon. Help us, O oh God, put our faith and our trust and our hope and our love back in you. And when we do this, we're not on our own, but following in the example you gave us through your son, Jesus the Christ, in whose name we all pray the words that he taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The way that we end every single time we gather together at the gathering is to come back to the altar, uh, to experience Holy Communion, to taste, touch, feel, know the presence uh, the gift, the love of Christ that's with us every single day of our life, not just the end, not just the high moments, not just the low moments, every single moment we come back to this table. As I invite our communion stewards to come forward and help with the serving of communion, I do so with the reminder that this is not the First United Methodist Church's table. This is Christ's table. It's, it's open to all people like Christ's offer of love and grace. Who are, whoever you are, wherever you're from, whether you're a member or not, whether you understand yourself to be a Christian or not, no matter what, how old you are, whatever, this table is for you. It's at this table that we remember that on the day in which he was to give himself up for us, Christ had dinner with his best friends, his disciples. During that dinner, he took a piece of ordinary bread, and knowing what they would face, knowing the doubts they would experience, the worries they would have over money and everything else, he said, remember this, take and eat. This bread is my body, which is broken for you, given up for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After the meal was over, he took a cup of ordinary table wine, gave thanks over it, blessed it, passed it, and said to all of them, take and drink, this is my blood of the new covenant, poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. The new covenant, the new promise, the new deal that offers forgiveness when we're low, when we fall behind, when we mess up, promising that Christ is there to catch us, redeem us, remake us, reconcile us over and over and over again. Uh, we always celebrate communion with uh, non-alcoholic grape juice. We do so because we don't want anyone to ever have to choose between sobriety and the sacrament. 
Uh, we also have a special gluten-free station. I'll be uh, positioned with it over here to the side. We even have a special gluten-free cup so that uh, you don't have to deal with any glutes getting into it. Uh, glutens. <laughs> Liberal arts major. Um, it's for all people. It's for all people. It is for you now and every day. The table is set. The meal is ready. Come forward. Be fed.
seated in majesty. You are the risen King. Death could not hold you down. You are the risen King. Seated in majesty. As we come to the end of our gathering, just a quick request. If you could help pick up any pens, Bibles, pieces of paper, things along those lines, just bring them to the rear of the room. Uh, we're really good stewards of this room. We use it for a lot of stuff, and it immediately turns over into another worship service in just a few minutes. So just helping kind of police your area uh, goes a long way. And so uh, now please bow your head and receive this benediction. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May God's face raise to shine upon you. And in the midst of your life, when worries about money pop up, remember... Quiet your heart, settle your spirit, and focus back on the message of Christ. Amen. Go in peace.